to allow, allow me to be able to teach this class to talk about the things that are vitally important to us. I ask this in the blessed name of your holy child, Yeshua, Jesus, the righteous one. Amen. Amen and amen. We're going to use as a anchor for our class tonight, Romans chapter 12, the last phrase of verse 2. We dealt with that on Sabbath, and I found it to be very enriching to me. I hope that it was enriching to others. If not, I hope that it would damn those that looks that look upon his word as being something trite and trivial. He said in First Samuel chapter two, around the thirtieth verse. Those that honor me, I will honor. And those that despite, despise me, in the King James Version, it says, he'll lightly esteem, but you look the word up, it means he'll curse. The time has come, we need to choose sides, whether before the Most High and his calls in this war, we don't see it as war. But I remember growing up hearing people sing songs. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier. I, I remember songs like that. Onward Christian soldier. And yet, when it comes down to it, we're not worthy to even be called a soldier. So the latter part of Romans chapter 12, I know you can't see my screen yet. It just says that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. My title for tonight, the thought, for tonight, and then the title I'll give you afterwards because to put it all in one topic or title was too hard for me, and I decided to give my brain a little relaxation. So the topic is, why is the will of God banished in the lives of many people that have been charmed by selected portions of the Bible? And the topic is, the Bible is no more than a dangling cross to the damned. Let's go ahead and open up our page and share before I forget to share. And then I'll be thinking you can see what I'm doing and you can't even see it. You see, I meet people. I've met people, I know people that go to church that profess to follow the teachings of Christianity. I meet those that say that they're Israelite, those that have had their DNA tested and they can prove that they at least come from the places and have the blood types of the people that are buried in that area. Of the, uh, over in Palestine, as we call it. That means nothing to God if you're not following his will. So I say, when I look and I listen to people, they tell me they love the Bible. I ask them to tell me five things that the Messiah, Jesus, Yahshua said, often they can't tell me. I mean, people that tell me you're saved by grace and it doesn't matter how you live. I meet people that tell me that they have the Jesus mindset. He was a magician, et cetera. 
I've seen people that I know that practice debauchery, that will do witchcraft, etc. And they say they love this Jesus. I know people that will go to church and don't read their Bible, but they carry it. When I was younger, I used to wish that every time somebody had a Bible in their hand, a little light would come on their head. I mean, a big light would come on their head and let you know how many pages of it they've read. I bet you'd be some with a little zero with a line going through it, like not. They've been charmed by the Bible and certain portions of it and think that they believe the Bible. And yet the selected portions of the Bible that they've been taught has taught them to banish the will of God. The will of God is contained in his word. So you'll see people with a cross dangling from their ear, dangling from their chest, and that to them is enough to save them. It can no more save you than a, a piece of leather that has been prayed over by a Roman Catholic priest called a scapula can save you no matter what you're doing. When you do it, as long as you wear that, that's what it's taught. So I'm going to read the passage and then I'm going to go into it. And it is bothering me. So therefore, I want to make sure that I, I put it out here on the table so that we can look at it. Paul says out of everything when he talked about that olive tree and he started in the 11th chapter in the 23rd, I mean, in the 13th verse of Romans, he starts speaking to the Gentiles and was telling them in particular not to boast, not to be high-minded, that the Most High God haven't gotten rid of all of Israel just those that are broken off. And if they didn't remain in unbelief, they could be grafted in again. Oh, yes, they would have consequences, major. But he said, but you need to understand the severity as well as the goodness of Yah God because to those that were broken off severity and you, because he had compassion, you were brought in. But the same thing will, not might, will happen to you if you live like they did. But a idealized view of the Bible, a charmed view of God's word will tell you, it doesn't matter how you live. God is like this genie in the bottle. The Most High God loves you so much. He actually died. He actually came, sent his son, and died for you while you were yet sinners. And you hadn't done anything right, and he did that. And instead of you seeing that as an obligation or being taught that that's an obligation of how serious it is for one to be in him. And how are you in him? First John chapter 2, when you read it, the fifth verse. And whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. And hereby we know that we are in him. You're not just in him because of what you say. But if you have a charmed view of the Bible, you carry it, got a Bible app, you feel that you're good. You're like the people in Ezekiel day. Come and let's hear him preach. It's like a beautiful song they said. Well, I want you to listen to these two verses and as I talk to you tonight out of God's righteous and beautiful word. If you find that you're one of those that have been charmed by the Bible and haven't read it, charmed by the Bible and don't understand it, and the Bible is no more than a dangling cross from your neck, understand you're damned. I say understand you're damned, you're lost. And unless you repent and understand that his word is authoritative, that just like you speak and you want to be understood, 
just like you can write something that's your voice actually put on paper. That until we listen to the voice of the Most High God, someone can charm us with what we think that it is, and it will be no more than a rabbit's foot to us. I would have used the word talisman when I was writing my title, but I said many people don't know what a talisman is, but they know what charms are. Listen to what our passage says here in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies, that mercy is compassion of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Notice it didn't say acceptable to Tim, a church, a denomination, state or a government that forces its will and its style of morality on you to the point that you can be put to death. It said acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, your logical service, reason, logos, when you're dealing with the mind, we're talking about when you go back all the way from chapter 12 backwards, everything he said from chapter one, all the way up to chapter 12, he said all of that. And then he zeroed in on the Gentiles. You're not just in here. Don't be like Israel. Think they're always saved. No matter what they did, although I, I destroyed their temple, I, I burned down Jerusalem. I had it done by Nebuchadnezzar around 586 B.C. I sent the northern part into captivity in 722 BC. Gentiles don't come in here thinking that you can use me as a talisman and be charmed by the sweet words and the promises that I made and never look at the severity. So he says in verse two, and be not conformed to this world. Don't assimilate it. Don't assimilate or be forced into the mold of a cookie cutter. As a boy, Tim, he was the only child and his mother cooked. And we would get together. We would, she would teach me how to make dough and how to roll it. And I'd roll it with my hand and she would take flour and make the pan not stick. And then she'd take a, a little piece of they, I forgot what they call rolling pin, but it's a piece of wood that's round with a handle and you dust it with flour and you roll it back and forth and it would get thin or as thick as you want the cookie to be. And she had the thing look like a little man, we call it a gingerbread. You put dip that in the flour, stick it into the dough, shake it a little bit, and then you come out and that shape would be taken out of the dough and we put it on the tin. He might have one look like a star. Might have one that looked like something else. That's being molded or conformed to the shape of that thing. So that dough was conformed to the shape of that thing. So when he baked it, it would look like that. Well, if you don't have ever cooked anything, if you take some soup and put it in a square bowl, it's going to be conformed to the shape of the square. If it's round, if it's rectangular, the same thing. Our world is always trying to conform us to the shape and the morality that exists. So if the morality is don't get married, be conformed. If the morality is don't say anything about the wickedness of political leaders, that's the form. If the morality is boys can be girls, girls can be boys, they can they can make their mind up as they go, that's the shape. Paul is saying, be not conformed to this world. There were a lot, a lot, a lot of religions in the Roman Empire because the Roman Empire had taken over the places where what we would call the demons had dwelt in the land with the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Somebody say, but I thought Shem was the righteous one. Well, Shem was the right Shem was righteous, but he had a lot of children. 
all of his children were not Abram or Abraham. All right. So let's read the rest of this. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. It's about your mind. If you can be conformed, if you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then it should be easy to understand that you could be conformed by your mindset, which is there, which is already in your culture, which is already in your cult, which is already in what you've been taught many times to see the Bible as a charm or hanging a cross on your neck will absolve you from sin. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you're going to prove what is that good and acceptable will of God, do not divorce that from verse number one in chapter 12, that you're presenting your body as a living sacrifice. We've talked about the sacrifices and how the sacrifices of the animals being killed and all of that being slaughtered and, and the smoke going up as a, as a sweet smelling savor to God that the animal represented us or you as your person that have sinned and the death has to take place. And then the fire of the purification and the smoke going up. If the smoke went up, it was as if the Most High God accepted you. But it was not about killing the animals. It was about you seeing how egregious your sin was. But it's also to take you deeper to see what the Most High God was going to do for us himself. What he was going to do in sending his son, God the Son. And that just like you were to identify with that animal, you were to identify with the Son of God. And how do you identify with him? First John 2 and 5. Whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected, and hereby know we that we are in him. I want you to understand that the myth of the Bible, the being charmed of the Bible was something that was also placed upon or dangled in front of the Messiah. Not the cross that we people wear, but the charming of God's word without looking to see what it really means. Let's take a look at it so that we'll be able to extract some of the sweetness and some of the juice out of it. Let me take you here to Luke chapter four. I'm going to go to Luke four. And as I go to Luke four and open it up, I want you to see what the scripture says. In Luke chapter four, verse one, it says, and Jesus being filled or full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the spirit into the wilderness, mirroring what happened with Israel when Israel was taken from Egypt. They were led into the wilderness, okay? Because this is when the Most High God tried them. Remember, Israel was his son, his firstborn. Now, the same kind of thing that happened with Israel, they got fascinated with the God that could deliver them but they did not want to do his will. They wanted the benefits. They wanted to have the salvation. They wanted to be able to eat. They wanted to be able to have all of the, the, the niceties of life, but not do his will. I'm not getting ready to teach that now. I alluded to it. So the Bible says in verse 2 of Luke chapter 4, being 40 days tempted of the devil, the wicked one. It says in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil taketh, and the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command that this stone be made bread. If you're the Son of God, 
And I know what power the Son of God, the Son of God, really has. I know. He's the one that created all things, even me. I mean, but that's not something that people will understand. Uh, but anyway, because all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made that John talks about in the first chapter. And Jesus answered him saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Knowing the power of the Son of God, knowing that he was able to even rain down manna for the children of Israel to eat, this one said to him, if you be the Son of God, you don't have to really worry about what the Most High God has said. You don't have to worry about what he's told you to come here and tell the people. He's your daddy. His word said you're able to do certain things. You don't have to be faithful to him. Just make us know that you're his son. Turn these stones into bread. Yet the Messiah, interested in doing the will of God, not being charmed by, we didn't have what we call the printed Bible here, but they did have a copy of the law where you would have the um, Ark of the Covenant. And so the Messiah says, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of God. In other words, the Messiah was interested in what the word of God said, not a few selected scriptures to make you feel good about being or knowing God's name, his title, or that you can just be religious and be okay. Well, that didn't work. So he tries again. Verse number five. And the devil taketh him up into a high mountain and showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment's time. All the kingdoms of the world. No doubt, maybe Babylon. Maybe Assyria. That which Persia ruled and reigned over. That which the Greeks ruled. And what Rome was ruling right now. Tell me where you get these names from. Well, the, the last four, the first one, I just know about Assyria. But when we start really talking about Daniel's statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw in Daniel chapter 2, it was actually Babylon, Persia, Greece, in Rome, Rome still exists today. And the devil says, all this power will I give thee. And the glory of them, the glory, the ability for those people to honor and worship you. For well, that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it. You see, son of man, there's something about your father that has the attitude that to whomever you yield yourselves, slaves or servants to obey. His servants you are to whom you obey. Whether it's obedience unto him, which is life, or disobedience, to destruction. They honor me. They worship me. And I'll let you in. Just come and do what I say. And then he says in verse number seven, if, there, if thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And he answered and said, look, and he answered and said unto him, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God in him only 
shall thy serve. What we're looking at is he's saying, all of this that you can offer me, and I am the son of God, I look blessed. The people will bow down and worship me. And if I'm not interested in doing the will of God and the people bow down and worship me, if you're telling me the truth, I will have looked at God's word as if it's a charm, not the authoritative commandment of the most high. And I could be walking around being called Messiah and be damned. So what did the Messiah do? He says, this is the will of God. This is what God has said. Thou shall worship the Lord thy God and him only shall thy serve. I'm here. I'm here. And I've taken on humanity. I have humbled myself and I'm, be, I'm obedient now. And though I am a son, yet I'm going to learn obedience by suffering to be a human and whatever else is brought upon me. And I've gone 40 days and 40 nights without eating. And here you come saying there's another way that I can have what the father wants me to have, to have rule to rule the kingdoms of the world. And you're offering me another way. I don't want your dangling cross. I don't want to be charmed in the saying, I know that God wants his son to have this and I have to do nothing. I don't even have to obey his word. I don't have to be faithful to him to get it. Therefore, I said, what you're saying is only, is only words of charm, words of idolatry that I can still hold on to his name but I can be serving you. You said that in your statement. Well, verse number nine says, and he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee. That is true. He is not lying. He's given him scripture. He's charming him with the scripture. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to give him a portion of scripture enough to make him banish the will of God in his life. Just do this. But what did the Messiah say? Well, he said he'll give his angels charge over thee and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest at any time thy dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I submit to you, Paul had to urge the people. He had to urge the people to get their minds right because the individuals did not know. The individuals did not care about God's word. And that's why he had to say, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. You can be told things that are in his word, and they can be told to you to the vantage point or the benefit of those that are supposed to be teaching you, whether it's a pastor, a deacon, or whatever, whether it's somebody on the job, whether it's somebody in Hollywood, whether it's somebody in the music industry, whether it's just somebody down the street will allow you to be part of family in their gang or in their denomination. What are you willing to give up and allow God's word to be banished in your life and then somebody give you a portion of it and charm you and you take God's word and make it of none effect and make their word of full effect, full idolatry with his word. Because you don't care to know the whole counsel of the Most High God. This is how the book of Romans has gotten to be perverted. This is how people were able to go and rob countries, rape women, put people on ships, 
destroy homes, destroy lives, destroy family, castrate, and then make laws when they set up government and say one group of people weren't even human. And then do it and say, you know what? We love God. We love the Bible, but they are savages. And since they're savages, we can call them chattels. And since we have redefined them not as humans, we can do whatever we want to do to them. They're not the only ones that have done that. Anytime a person can break in somebody's house and plunder them, carjack them, kill them, they're getting what they can have to participate in the kingdom of this world in the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. And when these things happen, these people are promised something. And many of them, when they go to trial, they say they're Christians. Well, 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 let's look and see what the will of God is. How does this work? Let me go back to Romans 12 and I will show you. I wanted you to see that what ends up happening many times is that people hear a portion of the scripture, they get charmed by it, and they say they love the Bible, and they don't they don't know it. They have no rebuttal for half truth, like the Messiah did when he was presented them. So it's talking about acceptability to God. So let's go back to verse two. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Did you see the Messiah did not allow his mind to go for what was being offered when he knew that he needed to be acceptable unto God? That was his reasonable service. Well, he says that you may prove what is that good and, and acceptable will of God. Let's, let's look at the will of God. I got some stuff that I have pulled up on the computer, and I just want you to kind of look at some things that when the Bible talks about the will of God. Now, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, listen to what the Bible talks about here. It talks about Christ and we're to come to him and do things by him. So it says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. If I come back here and show you that in Romans chapter 12, verse number one, he tells you to present your body as a living sacrifice. There it is here. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. I've already talked on Sabbath about you being a living sacrifice, whereas the dead sacrifice represented you and you were to be dead to this world while you yet are alive, then that would be the form of a living sacrifice. But there's more to it and we didn't get into that. So when I show you what was being said here in Hebrews chapter 13, because what happens in chapter 13, they are actually teaching the people that would have thought that you were coming up with something new and they weren't coming up with something new. In actuality, what was happening is they were showing the continuation of what had been written by Moses and the prophets from the mouth of God. So the writer here says, let, let me just open it. I feel better opening it so you can look above it. It says, talking about the Christ, verse 13, let us go forth unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. Those that are in Christ, those that keep his word, those who verily the love of God is perfected, and hereby we know we are in him. Let us go outside the camp. It says here we have no continuing city. We have no continuing city because our tabernacle, our true tabernacle is in heaven. The heaven of Jerusalem is not on earth yet. We have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. So the writer says, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That's why you live. The fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. I think that if you look at that, that little bit should be explanatory plain. I want you to see, well, Paul is not coming up with something new here. Neither is the writer of the book of Hebrews. Listen to what it says that what we call the law, but it's actually the instruction of God. In Leviticus 7 and 12, 
it says, if he offer for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer it with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and cakes mingled with oil and flour, a uh, uh, fine flour fried. I want you to understand they had thanksgiving offerings. They had animals that they offered as a thanksgiving offering. Paul, it will tell us that we are to use our lips to be just like cows brought before the Lord as a thanksgiving offering. Let me show you that that was not something new. Look at 2 Chronicles 7 and 6. And the priests waited on their officers, the Levites, with their instruments of music of Yahweh, which David the king had made to praise Lord because of his mercy and do it forever. When David praised by their ministry and the priests sounded the trumpets, before them all Israel stood, the offering, the sacrifice of praise. There's a sacrifice of praise. The singing, the music. You hear people sometimes when you see them, they say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Well, the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for that is hallelujah. That's what they would say. Hezekiah in his day of revival. It says, then Hezekiah answered and said, now ye have consecrated yourselves to Yahweh, the priest. They were not ready for the sacrifice. They had to go through a procedure to get clean, to be able to be sanctified before him to offer sacrifices. So he says, now you have consecrated yourself to Yahweh to come near and bring sacrifice and thank offerings. Thank offerings. They had the symbol as well as the substance. The substance is giving God thanks to the house of the Lord and the congregation brought in the sacrifice and the thank offerings. Let me show you that under what we call the Old Testament, that they were able, some were able to go past the animal as an offering of thanks to the heart. In Psalm 50 and 14, listen to the psalmist, offer unto God thanksgiving. And pay thy vows to the Most High. Thanksgiving, living sacrifice. Learn how to be thankful to him. Psalm 50, 23. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. He didn't say a bull, a goat, or a heifer. If out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, Whoso praise him, whoso offer him praise, whoso offer praise his name to glorify his name, honor his name, as well as their lips offering thanksgiving, whoso offers praise glorify me and to him the order of his conversation or his lifestyle aright, will I show the salvation of God? Let me, I'm not, I don't have a thousand of them. In Isaiah 57 and 19, listen to what Yah says. I create the fruit of the lips. When I read the first one, you said he could put mixed flour with it and certain things like that and they can fry it. Yah says, I create the fruit of the lips. Shalom, shalom, or peace, peace to him that is afar off and to him that is near, save Yahweh. And I will heal him. Listen. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 20, 21 and 12. Listen. I want you to see the living sacrifice. The fruit of the lips. The heart toward him. Not killing an animal in your hearts. Not toward him. I need you to be able to see as a living sacrifice. One of the things that's demanded. That, that's acceptable to him is our mouths toward him. And in order for our mouths to be toward him, our minds got to be toward him because where your mind is, where your heart is, your mouth will speak. Matthew chapter 21 and 12, when the Messiah went into the temple and saw that people were in there not doing the will of God, but they had used God's word as like a talisman. They had used his word like a charm and they thought that they were right before him because of that. 
listen to what the Messiah says. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written that my house shall be called the house of prayer. In other words, not just the incense. The incense was a symbol. My house will be called the house of prayer, offering an incense offering before me. But you have made it a den of thieves in the temple. You felt good about the temple. Yes, they did. And how did they do that? By using select portions of the scripture and charm themselves. And he says, it says, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying and saying, Hosanna, Lord save, or our Lord save, they start singing Hosanna. It says, Hosanna to the son of David. They were sore displeased. They're giving him praise, giving him honor. These people that have been charmed when they hear the people that are accurately following God, were looking to the Lord of glory to bless them, they were displeased and said unto him, here is thou what thee say? And Jesus said unto them, yea, have you never read? Have you never read? You up here calling yourself serving God. You got your own way of doing things. Have you never read? Have you never heard the voice of God? Are you just charmed by the ritual? Is it just that this temple to you is just something off a lacquer that you can wear, a tassel that you can wear, and you feel safe while you're damned? Listen to what he says. He says, have you never read out of the mouths of babes and suckling? Thou hast perfected praise. Out of those they haven't lived long enough, those that don't consider themselves to be so great, that think more highly than they ought to think, that don't think soberly. Those are the ones that are charmed by the outside things that profess religion. But he said, out of the mouths of the ignorant, the babes, those that are willing to learn, those that are willing to be fed, he says, you have perfected praise. Let's move on down to the will of God. This same Paul wrote a people in Thessalonica. Some might call it Thessalonica. Listen to what he says when he wrote, he wrote these people a letter. He hadn't been there that long, but he wrote them a letter. He says, furthermore, we beseech you. Notice that's his word. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Perfect, prove the perfect will of God. Now he's saying, Furthermore, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by our Lord Jesus Christ, that if you that as you have received us, how you ought to walk to please God. It is no, you just make a prayer. It is no saying you love God's word and not doing it. It is no wearing some kind of cross. He says, we exhort you. We exhort you, we entreat you by the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have received of us, how you ought, how you are obligated to walk. What does that word walk means? That means to live. Peripateo is the Greek word. How you ought to walk to please God. Remember, we're trying to understand what does he mean? What is that good and acceptable will of God? Okay. It says, walk to please God so that you would abound more and more, so that you would grow and that you would become more and more. But it's not what people say, you don't have any works. God does it all. Paul is saying, uh-uh, you can't just stay where you are. 
you need to grow more and more, but we'll, we'll see. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. When we talk about commandments, we're not talking about suggestions. He said, I got commandments from the Lord Jesus. But if you don't love God's word and you're not teaching people to love God's word, his commandment is nothing. And when you read in the scripture that the Messiah tells his disciples, you go into all the world and you teach people, commanding them to observe all things that I have told you to do. Well, we don't believe in those things, but look at what he told his disciples, his apostles before he left. In John 15, 10, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love conditionally, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. You want to be in him? You want to stay in his love? It's really easy to see what you got to do. But if you got a hard head, if you've been led by the era of the wicked, then what will, it, what will happen is you'll be walking in darkness instead of light. Instead of walking in light, instead of darkness. Now notice what he says. As we get, let me read the whole verse again for you. Know what commandment we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. Let's open this Bible back to Romans 12 and 2. Romans 12, 2. So that you can see it and not just hear me. It says, you want to be, you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Paul wrote this letter to Rome. Paul wrote this letter to the Thessalonians, and he says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication that you should abstain from the things that I've talked to you about in the first chapter. That when men, they took the truth of God and they suppressed it and they held it in unrighteousness and they glorified the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever, amen, and exchanged the glory of God for different cultures, for birds, different men, full-footed beasts, creeping things. He gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which were not convenient. And this is one of the things that he did. Abstain from pornea, sexual immorality, not just man with woman. Verses 18 of the first chapter all the way to 32 tells you that. He says that every one of you should know you are obligated to know how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. Those that teach treat the Bible like a talisman, like a charm, and say that they love the Bible. This this part of the scripture is just totally anathema. It's damned, it's cursed before them. They will actually go and do fornication while wearing a cross. How are you telling me you're not conformed to this world just because you got a cross on? How can you tell me you're not conformed to this world just because you have a Bible, but you're not discerning that what God has said has to be done? He said, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. When he said that you may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God, this is, do you approve of this? Do you approve of what he says? Does your life approve of it? Or do you say, I got a Bible, I go to church. I got a Bible, I go on the side of the street and I preach. I got a Bible and you know what? Everything is about grace. You're trying to give me works. Well, he says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, talking about your body and sanctification and honor. That same Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, that the fornicators, the adulterers, the murderers, and he goes on and he says they're effeminate. The, male, the one that's on the top and the one that's on the bottom and extortionists shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He says the same thing in Galatians 5 and 19 where he talks about the works of the flesh. And he says that these people that do such things, he said, I've told you before and I've told you in time past, if you do these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not going to quote the Revelation 21 and 8 where it tells you who's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. I'm going to leave you some work to do. Revelation, that is. 
21 and 8. So he says, you possess your vessel of sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, evil cravings. I mean, you know, just like you can crave something sweet, you can crave something evil. They might call it an addiction, but we're talking about evil craving sin. Even as the Gentiles, which know not God. Now, can you see what Paul said about the mercies of the compassion of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice? He didn't have to do that for them. He says in verse six that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. You think you're just having sex. You think you're just having fun. And both of you all are leading each other to hell. It has a kind of defraud when a person is married and they don't give themselves to one another. But he says that in no that you no man no way defraud your brother. This same Paul will explain it even more so when we get to Romans 13. He said, because the Lord is the avenger of all such. When he's talking about present your body as a living sacrifice, this is not just something that just it's a nice thing to do. This is something that if all you've been doing is given selected portion of the scripture and you love these selected portions of the scripture and you've been charmed by these selected portions of the scripture, you have banished the will of God in your life. If you're fornicating, if you commit adultery, if you're stealing, if you're defrauding your brother, if you're actually putting something above God's word, you have banished the scripture. You didn't just go to a church where they say, we just doing New Testament. We're not doing Old Testament. You have banished him because the New Testament is going to reiterate that which was iterated in what we call the Old Testament. Let's go beyond. It said that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in such manner. The Lord is, he says, the Lord is the avenger of such. He's going to judge as we also have forewarned, I understand you don't think there's to be any warning. You ain't got a cross dangling from you. As we have forewarned and testified, for God has not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. Uh, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God, holy, holy holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Here he's saying, God has not called us to fornication. God has not called us to uncleanness. God has not called us to defraud our brothers. He, he is actually going to fight against that. He's the avenger. He said, God has not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. So even if you have banished the scripture because you've been charmed by somebody giving you a certain part of scripture, you haven't read the rest of it, you don't listen to somebody. Paul is saying, let's get this straight. That's what he, not what he did. So when you have these people saying Paul changed the gospel, that's because they've been charmed by somebody's teaching and they haven't really read what Paul had to say. Now, look at what he says. He therefore that despises. If you despise or you reject what has been said, you reject not man or you despise not man, but God who had also given us of his Holy Spirit. What was the spirit of truth to do? John 16 and 8, to convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You think that that's all that we got in the will of God. I pulled up a, a small passage list and I said, you know, we really need to look at these kind of things because what ends up happening is we have people over and over all across the world that take God's word and they play with it. And in playing with God's word, what we've done is banished him. There'll be some people, and I've talked to a lot of them, God knows I have. They took God's word and if you start telling them what God said, they fight you. They will fight to the death. They hate God's word so much. They say, I know I'm saved. It doesn't matter what you say, Tim. We know what God's word say, and we don't need you to tell us anything. So I pull up some scriptures here, and I want you to look at it. I have them highlighted. First Thessalonians 5 and 8, look on the left panel. 
It says, in everything, give thanks. That's the sacrifice of your lips. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You know, that sounds like an easy scripture, doesn't it? What about when you lose your job? What about if you persecute it? You see, because I read somewhere, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all oh, men of evil falsely against you for my name's sake. Luke 6, 22 says, jump and leap for joy. Matthew chapter 5 says, say, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. Do you believe it? Listen to what is said in Psalms 40 and 8. Before you ever had a New Testament, listen to the psalmist. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is in my heart. Notice when you see this. No, I want you to see who's actually the one that did this. The chief musician, a psalm of David. We're not talking about doing the time he was messing with Bathsheba. But look at what he says. I, I delight to do thy will. If this is what's holy and acceptable unto God, and David is doing this before the New Testament is written, how dare you say we should banish the Old Testament? Here is the essence of what God wanted back then. Not a dangling cross. Not a frontlet around your head. Or a phylactery on you, or, or, or a different kind of thing, or going to the ta the temple or the tabernacle. He says, he says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here, this man has this heart back then. I delight to do your will. Oh, my God, your law, your Torah is in my heart. And I tell you, Hebrews chapter eight, if you start at verse eight and work your way down to about 11, if you start at chapter 10 and you start around the, uh, the 14th and the 15th, 16th, verse, you see y'all going to write his law in our hearts and in our mind, and we all supposed to know him. We all supposed to repent and delight to do his will. He said, they all shall know me. If you don't do his will, according to First John, you are a liar. Listen to Matthew 7, 21, because you have people that will make you feel like doing the will of God is not important because you have listened to what the little scriptures that they give you. and You've been charmed to think I don't have to obey God. I'm not any, under any obligation to obey him. I'm not under any obligation of any law or righteousness whatsoever. But what does Messiah say in Matthew 7, 21? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he but he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. Do, are we understanding what Paul is saying that you, that you actually be acceptable unto God? That you don't be conformed, that you transform, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable will? Of, you don't just prove it to man or to yourself. You got to be Messiah. Oh, I wish you could hear me talk. Listen to Mark 5, Mark 3.35. Messiah says, whosoever will do the will of God, the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. You say you're in the family of God? Or you, you say you're in the family of God? The Messiah excludes anybody that does not do the will of God, even if they like the idea of having a Bible, even if they like the idea of church, even if they like the idea of worship. I have a gold, silk, a wooden cross. He says the only ones that are my brother, sister, and mother uh -huh, are those that do the will of my father, which is in heaven. You want some more? John 4, 34, Jesus says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And you're saying you're in him and you don't feel that you have to do anything that's holy and acceptable unto God and that you're not making your body a living sacrifice and that you can be, you can be conformed to this world instead of transformed. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute. 
John 7 and 17 says, if any man will do his will, not wear a cross, not just hear a scripture and quote a scripture and don't know any of the context of it and be charmed by the Bible. He says, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak for myself. You have a lot of people that's walking around saying they love God, love the Bible and have not done the Bible, have not done the word that's in it. And they have no clue what his real doctrine is. Why? Because they won't do it. That's the kind of people that they happen to be. Let me take you to Colossians 1 and 9. Paul talks to some people in Colossae, a Gentilian nation. And he says, for this cause, since we have heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Why do you think we invest this time teaching the scripture? Why do you think we don't give you the feel good miss to make you jump up and down and be all excited and hot holly glory and, and chinky chinky? That you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and all understanding that you might walk worthy of you are unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthen with all might and all power uh, well all might according to his glorious power unto all patience along suffering with joyfulness and let's go back to the sacrifice giving thanks unto the father that have made us meet acceptable to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who having delivered us from darkness delivered us from the power of darkness has translated us into the kingdom of his son i could read more of that but i i just want i just wanted you to kind of get a taste why the will of God is so important. I won't read this in paraphrase. So I'm going to take you to Hebrews 10. The Bible says, but well, we need patience. We need endurance. That after we have done the will of God, that doesn't make everything seem right in your, wor in your world. Messiah did the will of God and they killed him. Paul did the will of God, he was put to death. Peter did the will of God, he was put to death. John did the will of God and he was said that he was banished to the Isle of Patmos. We don't want to do the will of God because we got something that we enjoy more and we are transformed to this world instead of, uh, instead of not what the scripture says, not being transformed. We're transformed by it and we like the idea of the Bible and certain particular passages that were given to us. We don't really like the real word of God. We've banished it in our minds. So he says, you need, you in need of patience that if you've done the will of God that you might receive the promise let me move because i want to go ahead and close out and the same people he wrote in thessalonians i want you to notice what he tells them in 5 and 23 first thessalonians 5 and 33 i mean in 23 and the very god of peace of shalom sanctify you holy w-h-o-l-o-y it means completely i pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our lord jesus christ i want you to understand what that means just because you made a sinner's prayer just because you say you love the bible walk around the cross that is not how you get to where you need to be with him. Remember, he said that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's what he said. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and 21, he says, prove all. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. What is good? The word of God is right. The word of God is good. The Messiah is good. He's the good shepherd. He says, abstain from all appearance of evil. We know that he's still talking the continuation where he told the people in four and three, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fornication, that you know how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor, and that you don't go and defraud anybody. This is chapter five. We, we know he's still on the same subject. And then he says, and the very God of peace, when you do the will of God, sanctify you wholly, not just when you pray, not just because you like two or three scriptures that would have you turning stones of bread or jumping from the pinnacle of the temple or bowing down and saying, well, I'm going to get everybody to be under power of me so I can go ahead and I can, I can do good in the land. I pray your whole spirit and soul, body be blameless unto the coming of our Lord. 
I want you to see that. Now look at what he says in John 17. He prayed that God will sanctify you holy. I want you to see how the Messiah said you could be sanctified holy. In John 17, 17, when he's praying to his father, he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. You want the information that will cause you to be sanctified. You want the information that was given to you so, so you would know the will of God. It's his word. His word is true. So in Acts chapter 20, verse 32, Paul, the same Paul, they wrote the letter to the Romans and to the Thessalonians or Thessalonians. He says, and now brethren, I commend you to God. I entrust you to God. And the word of his grace. We talk about grace, grace. I can live any kind of life I want to because I got grace. And I teach people that the grace of God is to empower you. It's to teach you to deny ungodliness and worldly lust so that you will live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior who has redeemed us to himself so that he would have a peculiar people zealous, zealous of good works. Somebody might say, Tim, I, I never heard that before. Where is it? So you get your Bible and you go to Titus 2. You put the 2 in there like I just did. And you do the 13. And I quoted that, looking for him, looking for the glorious appearing. But I, this is what I quoted to you. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Not just having some words to make you feel righteous or you got a cross you can wear. He wanted to redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, a special people zealous of good works. And he told that young Titus, you speak these things and you exhort and you rebuke with all authority. It doesn't matter if it's Charles Stanley or if it's Tony Evans or if it's Bob George or even if it was Tim Merritt or any other person that would tell you can live any kind of way you want to. You don't have to present your body as a living sacrifice. You say you love the Bible, I accept it, even if you don't know anything about it. You can go around and, and quote, you know, just name it and claim it. You can go around and quote, write the vision. It has nothing to do with what was done. It's the same way that the devil said, if you dash your foot against a stone, or no weapon formed against me will prosper. Really? Was it talking to you or was it talking about Judah? Was it talking about Israel? All kind of weapons would prosper against you when you're not walking and doing the will of God. When you're doing the will of God, you can still be put to death, but that weapon didn't prosper. But if you're outside the will of God, the weapon is prospering because you are supposed to be beat down. You are supposed to be damned. You are supposed to suffer. Why do you think he sent Israel into captivity? Because he said, if you turn away from me, I will do that. I will chasten you so that you will learn what it's like to be under the hand of man, making your rules, making your government so that you would want to come back and serve me. He told that Titus, you speak these things and you exhort and you rebuke with all authority and let no man despise you. Last one, Acts 20, where we were, where he says, 20 and 32, Paul says, and now, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance and to give you in the future. Do you understand we got to do the will of God in the earth till we die and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified? We have a problem. We have a group of people that say they love the Bible, but they love the idea of the Bible. They've been taught to banish the will of God from their lives. Because God is so good and so great and so loving, you don't have to obey him. And they've taken that form of idolatry and they present it as the gospel. So not only do they do that and, and possess it or treat it as if it's the gospel, they got one other thing that they do. They get crosses and things and they wear them. And when they wear those crosses and things on their neck, 
they take those crosses and they use those as if that allows them the opportunity to go against God's will and against his righteousness. And I submit to you, this is the problem that we have. And Paul was trying to teach against that. How was he teaching about that? He told them, don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good an acceptable and perfect will of God. The answer to the question, the will of God is banished from the lives of many people that have been charmed by selected portions of the scripture. It's done to cause people not to obey his word. It's banished because people want God to serve them instead of them serving the Most High. It gives a sense of comfort. And they've been charmed by smooth words, by selected portions of the scripture. Left out a lot of those that I gave, and there were thousands more. I do mean thousands. So the Bible subsequently becomes no more than a dangling charm, a cross, an eye of Horus, a onk, uh, what they call those things, crystals, becomes no more than that because it doesn't conform people to the image of the Most High's dear Son nor cause them to be sanctified to Him. What are we going to do about it? When the, if y'all will on, on Sabbath, we'll talk about what Paul said, for I say through the grace given to me to me to every monk, man that is among you not to think more highly than you ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about how that works. We'll talk about if you're going to be a preacher, if you're going to be a teacher, you need to be taught. You don't need to be charmed by just words. That's the problem that they had as the Jews or Israel. The temple of God's over here. The temple of God is over here. The temple of God is these. We live like we want to. He saved us. Same thing the Gentiles. Paul said he died for us while we were in sin. We ain't got to worry about nothing. Grace. Let's not be conformed to this world. Because of our mind. Let's be transformed because of our mind being renewed. That for his sake and our sake, we can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. With that, I close my message for tonight and I now open this class for discussion. If there's any discussion that's going to be had tonight and that needed to get out of my spirit because I, I realized that there is a idolatrous thing that the Bible is used as a tool to cause people not to do the will of God. Class is open for discussion. If there's any discussion to be had tonight, any discussion you all tell Tim. I don't think we have any discussion tonight. I don't know if if the audio is not working, but I think that it is. Well, I appreciate everybody that joined me tonight. And I ask that we all ask God to fill us with the knowledge of his will to all please him, to do every work in such a way that he'll be pleased with us. Good night, everybody, and thank you all for joining us. Amen, amen, and amen.